1, chapter 7. Very, very important chapter. We find out a ton about the proles, a ton about what Winston thinks of them, a ton about what Big Brother and the party thinks of the proles. The party is only 15% of the populace. That means the proles make up 85%. That is like two and a half, three of you. The rest of you are all proles. This whole book, don't we think that the party is in charge? The party has the numbers, the party's controlling the war party? No, it's just these three people. The proles over here. And this is where Winston really struggles, and he struggles throughout the book. Why can't the rebellion come? Look, you have 85%. You can take control and take down the hypocrisy that is Big Brother. But the problem is, you don't know. You don't know, or you don't care. Okay? Um, every time we read this, I instantly think of the movie A Bug's Life. Those ants collect food for the grasshoppers all the time. Flick stands up one time, Hopper, you know, messes them up and they leave. And so you see the grasshoppers having a good time. Remember, they're partying in that sombrero, right? And they're sitting up at the bar, which is just like seeds. And one guy goes, hey, let's just not even go back. Here we go. Oh, let's just not go back. And Hopper had a problem with that. So he took one curl and goes, does that hurt? He throws it and hits him. No. No, how about this? No. Well, how about this? And he rips the thing off the wall and just pretty much kills him. Okay? At the end, the big climax of it is they stand up to Hopper and everybody else. And Flick stands up and goes, you know, we are more than you. We outnumber you. You know that, don't you? And there's this moment where Hopper's eyes just kind of narrow. He doesn't say anything. He just kind of looks around, and that's where, you know, it goes nuts for the rest of the movie and so on. But, um... They have all of those, uh, those, those moments and elements of, um, you, you know, the, 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 just the, the dutiful ants just doing their own thing because that's what we've always done. They're not conscious to what it could be. The proles aren't conscious to what it could be. And so they are in that rut, that generational rut that just goes over and over and over again. Okay. The revolution that brings down Big Brother is not coming from the two and a half people up here. They, can never, they don't have the numbers. They don't have, they can't meet. They can't, because people get vanished and vaporized and all that. It has to come from out there. But you proles will never rise up because you are happy and, and not happy necessarily. You are content with getting your food for the grasshoppers. Okay? Um, Star Wars and Disney, you can connect so much to life and literature. And that's why at the bottom of 70, until they become conscious, they will never rebel. And until after they have rebelled, they cannot become conscious. So they can't learn and understand why they should rebel until after they rebel, and then ultimately, oh, look at what we could do. Well, but it's, it's a weird cycle. You, you can't do it. You can't catch up with it. It's always going to, it's always going to be ahead of them. We're on page 71. People every year, we start questioning, well, why don't the polls understand? What, the, party, the party doesn't care about the polls. How can they, you know, it's 85%. Why don't they care? Why don't they force them to do whatever? Here's what the party thinks about the polls. Uh, 71. So long as they continued to work and breed, their other activities were without importance. Left to themselves like cattle turned loose upon the plains of Argentina, they had reverted to a style of life that appeared to be natural to them, a sort of ancestral pattern, like getting the food for the grasshoppers. They were born. They grew up in a gutter, in the gutters. They went to work at 12. They passed through a brief blossoming period of beauty and sexual desire. They married at 20. They're middle-aged at 30. They died, for the most part, at 60. Heavy physical work, the care of home and children, petty quarrels with neighbors, films, Football, beer, and above all, gambling fill up the horizon of their minds. Do those traits or those things sound familiar? Isn't that what we do? You know, we get married, 20-ish. You know, you had your brief blossoming. You know, your beauty, sexual desire. Fine, you're married. Great, middle age at 30. You die 60. 
physical work all the time, taking care of home and kids takes up all your time, petty fights with your friends and neighbors, okay? Um, watching movies, sports, beer, gambling, a lot of little vices here. That's, and they just do that over and over. And then the next generation. So I think what we're seeing is, for the most part, we would be proles in this society. We wouldn't necessarily be the Winstons or the party members. Okay? That's important to understand. Okay? That we relate to these people. We related to the pro woman in the movie theater when they blew up those babies and the kids and, oh, you shouldn't show this to people. Sit down. Shut up. No, you shouldn't do this. To Remember, she was the one. Because what she was saying and feeling is probably what we felt, I would hope. Unless you're sick and twisted. Okay? Um, so to keep them in control was not difficult. A few agents of the thought police moved always among them, spreading false rumors and marking down and eliminating the few individuals who were judged capable. Not that they did anything and held a meeting, it's just, hmm, you seem capable. Bye-bye. So if you just sprinkle people out, you take care of those people, you have nothing to worry about. Um, but no attempt was made to indoctrinate them with the ideology of the party. Just let them like cattle on the, you know, just let them go and do their own thing. Let them worry about sports and drinking and gambling and children and all of these things. Let them have their things. The party, we're in control. Let's, let's keep it that way. Okay? And so this is what Winston struggles with. They will never know that they are being, you know, oppressed until they rebel. But they're never going to rebel because, hey, we, we're, we're in our rut. We're collecting food for the grasshoppers. Okay, so it's important to understand that, that, um, that moment. Um, page 72, 73, Winston finds himself looking through a history book. And he doesn't, he's not able to differentiate between the, what's true and what are lies. Because Big Brother would have controlled it. Okay. Um, how could you tell how much of it was lies? The only evidence to the contrary was the mute protest in your own bones. You know, that feeling like it just doesn't seem right. Right? It's not. It's not working. It's, something's wrong. But can you prove it? No. Okay. So Winston holds out. He goes, you know, just one. I had something in my hand. Right? Something in my hand. That Big Brother was fabricating. The history was lying. And that's that photograph. On page 74, 75. 74, 75. He had a picture with these three people, Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. Okay, they disappeared for a year. They come back into the public eye. They're tried for treason. They confess. They, you know, they're released. They write these articles telling you about how horrible they are, how great big brothers, all of these things. Okay? And then ultimately, they finally disappear again. But before they disappear the second time, Winston bumps into them where? At the Chestnut Tree Cafe. Okay? Because they were those disgraced party members. Um, they're sitting there talking. He looks at them and he mentions about how they look so frail and not like the, the mountain of men that they were before. It's like they were broken. And there's a song that plays underneath the spreading chestnut tree, I sold you and you sold me. And he notices that they start to cry. And that's the last time he ever sees them. Okay. Now these individuals eventually were, the second time they were arrested, they were executed. After confessing to the same old treasons, but even more treasons and more new things that these broken down men that Winston saw in front of them had committed again. Okay, different ones this time. Okay. Um, but this is very important, so pay attention to 77. Make a little note about that, <clears throat> especially about the, you know, the crying and aspect, because that might come back later um, for, our, for our purposes. But then 78, here is the photo. He has a photo with all three people. On the day that they were convicted and all of that stuff, that they were supposedly flying from Canada to Siberia to, to undermine Big Brother, to sell secrets to the Eurasians, you know, and everybody else, because we've always been at war with Eurasia, always. But the picture is not from that flight or, you know, Canada or Siberia. It was from New York. The three of them were together at a party function 
in New York on that date. Here is proof. The moment that it hit him, he puts it upside down, covers it, and backs away like, wow. Because as he goes on to say later on, he goes, it, it, it was enough to blow the party to Adam. It was concrete evidence. It was a fragment of the abolished past like a fossil bone which turns up in the wrong strata and destroys the geological theory. Uh, you know, T-Rexes are always just tropical, tropical, tropical. They, they couldn't, they don't have the, the skin or the blubber to, to, to withstand cold temperatures. What if we all of a sudden find T-Rex bones in Antarctica? Do you see how that, wait a minute, that totally, what? How were they able to, so it just totally starts to make you question everything you thought about T-Rexes. Now, I understand back then there weren't the poles. It was Pangea. I understand. Got it. But for the purpose of this example, they were in the Antarctic. Okay? Um, because up until now, if Winston ever questioned anything, like, man, shut up and prove it. Prove it. I, everything's changed by Big Brother. But now he says, I had a photo one time. Oh, yeah, where is it? Right there. Now that he has that proof, okay, now that he has that proof, people go, oh, well, if that's a proven lie. What else might there be? And then if that, then what else? And what, you see how that, that, that rock can pick up a lot of speed? Mm -hmm. That snowball rolling down the hill gets bigger, you know? Um, but he panics. What does he do with the picture? He memory holds it instantly. Once he calms down and comes back, he doesn't even look at it. He just takes his papers and memory holds it. Hopefully no one saw that. Hopefully no one was watching me because I had proof right there. And he regrets that because that is the concrete proof that he's, you know, that could have proven what he said to be true um, and made people a lot more skeptical of Big Brother. Um, Page 8081, the last couple things I want to talk about, then we'll be done. The very last line, look at the italics. Freedom is the freedom to say that 2 plus 2 make 4. If that is granted, all else follows. Well, duh, 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's not the point. What if Big Brother comes out and says, no, 2 plus 2 is 5. It's always been 5. I don't know why you're thinking that it's four. It's always been five. Well, because look in my textbook. It says that two plus two is, oh, it says it's five. Well, in my elementary textbook, it said two plus two is it's five. Two plus two is five. Huh, two plus two is five. But the freedom is to say, no, it's not. Two plus two is four. And that's what Winston is probably going to be more capable of doing this than all of those other gullible chocolate lovers, right? Okay. Um, you can do this with other things besides that, like, like my sweater. Blue, right? It, this is red. This has always been red. It's not blue. It's red. This is red. You have to fully believe that this is red. This is red. Big Brother wants you. This is red. This is red. No. This is blue. That is freedom. If you compromise that, and you say that it is five, or you say, no, you're right, this is red, you don't have any freedom. And remember, freedom is what? Slavery. OK? And so we have to make sure that you stay strong mentally. And Winston seems to be the only one thus far. You know, we have brotherhood and all of those guys, but we, we haven't met anybody. We just see it too. Uh, viewpoint. Okay? 81. A lot and lot of information in this particular chapter. Okay, 1.8. Um, not only does it provide a setting where, you know, pretty much all, well not all, but a, a major majority of, major majority, it's redundant, um, where uh, Act 2, or second part, uh, we spend time in with the apartment. Um, but we see a lot of uh, Winston's kind of um, travels into parole territory, parole country, parole district, whatever you want to call it. And we get to see their way of life a little bit. 
um, more up close, I think is the best way of saying that. Um, he finds himself walking around, <coughs> excuse me, down there on 82. He even throws out the idea, if there's hope, he had written in the diary, it lies in the proles. We spent a lot of time talking about that recently, about the frustration um, that he has because they lack the consciousness to fight and, and revolt. They don't have that. So why will they ever revolt? And they're the only chance for a revolt because the party members, they're, far, they're way too few. There's no way that they will ever r rile up because just the odds of them getting caught um, are great. Um, as he's walking around in 84 and 85, all of a sudden there's a lot of activity and we find out that uh, there's a bombing that's taking place. They have a sixth sense to this. Whether they are attuned and they can hear it, they just know. A woman picks her kid up, runs indoors. He throws himself down on the ground. Things explode all around. He gets himself up, dusts off, starts walking. What does he find in the little gutter? Finds a human body part. Just kicks it to the curb and keeps going. Keeps going. This must be normal around there. But remember, he was the, enjoying that video. Remember the movie theater real early on uh, with all the, the boat getting bombed and the kids and all that stuff. Um, maybe he's a bit desensitized to it, but he found a, a human hand severed at the wrist. He kicked it into the gutter and he kept going until he went to a, a pub, a, a, um, a place to drink. Um, page 85, a real quick mention, but yet it's very significant. Do you remember when we were talking previously how the party keeps the proles just kind of doing their own thing, like cattle grazing in Argentina? And they talked about how they spend their lives with family and drinking and working and gambling and all of that. This lottery is very interesting. Okay, Make a little note here if you, did, if you kind of breezed over it or you need to go back to it. Um, the lottery for some of these proles is their life. It is their focal point in discussion. It is they come up with these theories. You imagine how complex they could get with regards to, well, this number's never won before. This number's won more than anything. It's going to hit again. Okay. Um, those of you that have prob probability and stats, you know that <laughs> it doesn't matter if something's hit eight or nine times in a row. It's still, well, depending on what game you have, it, the, the odds are the same of hitting something else. Roulette. Okay. Red and black. It's not a 50-50 shot because there's that little green on there, right? At zero. Some houses, casinos, have double zeros. So they have a zero and a double zero to take the probability and the house odds uh, to make them greater and make your odds of winning even lower. I'm not getting into math, but just to let you know, it doesn't matter. Um, I was at a casino. I saw it hit red 18 times in a row. I was not betting because if I would have bet, what would have happened? It would have been black. But some people keep riding it out and riding it out. But shouldn't it go red, black, red, black? Maybe a couple reds, a couple, shouldn't it, you know, flip it, heads, tails? Shouldn't it, for the most part, be about equal? Sometimes it runs all reds, sometimes it runs all black. That's why gambling isn't a surefire monetary thing. Um, but some people were making some money on it, but not me. Um, so the lottery was really interesting. Um, they didn't spend too much time on it, but it really was their main, uh, for some of these people, their main their reason to exist. Um, he hits up this old man in a bar, and he wants to talk to him because really the old man in the old generation is the last connection to the world before Big Brother. He says to the old man, surely you were a grown man before I was even born. What was it like? What were the things? And he described, you know, the men in the hats. And you've got to get out of the way. So even the proles then, the, the capitalists, the people in charge, you know, the top hats, stove top hats, they would come walking and you'd get out of the way. Oh, governor, how you doing? You know, talk to them and so forth. And there was just a social class structure at that point. Okay? So it did exist. But however, his, his mind is not as attuned to the past as what Winston would like. And Winston's like, I can't read the books. And as we've established, the reason you can't focus on the books is because who wrote the books? Big brother. Or if he didn't write them, he's amended them and fixed them so that it's a pro big brother stance. So how can you truly believe? So really the last connection is the elderly. Okay, World War II vets. Now it, I mean, we're quickly losing our World War II vets. Have you noticed that? 
Okay? When I was alive, we still had World War... When I was alive. When I was younger, we still had World War I vets coming and talking and so on. There were a lot of World War II vets. They were old, grandparents, above grandparents, but they would come and talk. There are very few now. Every year they go out to Pearl Harbor, the, the veterans of Pearl Harbor, the bombing. Fewer and fewer are going. I mean, there are stories where there's only two or three that are making the trip now because they're, some of them can't make the trip and most of them have died. That was, what, 70 years ago. And if they were 18 or 19, add 70 to that. How old are they now? They're not going to be traveling a lot. There's not going to be very many of them left, no matter how young they were in the war. So now we're getting to uh, where the elderly for us are Korea, Vietnam. Okay? And by the time you're my age, it'll be, you know, the, you know, the end of Vietnam or, you know, Desert Storm and that type of thing. When you get a, you know, when your kids are coming through, that type of stuff. Um, and so your only connection to that past was to hear it from their mouth. Because Big Brother, hopefully, <laughs> hasn't corrupted their mind and changed it. But he did not get what he wanted from the old man. Um, good, 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 good. Page 93. He left the bar and started walking around, and before he knew it, he found himself outside that antique shop. And it's the same antique shop that he purchased his diary, okay? So he goes, huh, I'll walk in. And as he walks in, the gentleman who works for Mr. Charrington, he recognizes him, doesn't he? Hey, I remember you before. I sold you a, I sold you a book. Come on in. Take a look. Take a look. See what we got here. See what we got here. Um, and it's just like any antique shop you've been to where there's a bunch of old stuff around. And Winston, who likes old stuff, obviously, things that are, you're not supposed to have, a diary or a book in Big Brother World, he probably is finding a lot of things of interest here. Um, the old man says, I recognize you on the pavement, and so on. Winston finds one piece, a piece of coral. You guys all know what coral looks like, okay, from the ocean. A piece of coral encased in solid glass. And he finds that very interesting. Why? What's that? Uh, maybe he's never seen the ocean. I mean, they live on an island to some degree. To some degree. Maybe it's a lot different. Maybe he hasn't. Maybe he hasn't. It's not so much the connection to the sea, but how old is that coral? How, how old? I have it marked here. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, oh, that's coral, that is. It must have come from the Indian Ocean, middle 95. They used to kind of embed it in the glass. That wasn't made less than 100 years ago. More by the look of it. So now, why is he interested in it? Matt? Like everything else? So this has actually existed before, before what? This it existed before Big Brother. This piece of coral was encased. This existed. This is proof. This is something that cannot be changed. It can disappear, right? But it can't change. This coral is protected. The air within that glass, you know, that's, it's protected from the outside. No one can get to it. And here's proof of something concrete that existed before Big Brother. Okay? Way before Big Brother and before the history books and so on. So it's very interesting to him. Okay? It's very interesting because later on we'll talk about that this coral may or may not be a metaphor for somebody else and for something else. And that'll play out in the second part and we'll talk more about it. But ultimately the thing that he finds most interesting is go up these stairs, a little apartment for him to rent. And he can afford it. He's not like a millionaire or anything, but he can afford it. Um, and so he goes up there and he's looking around. Some people used to live here before, but you know, I'm kind of selling things off a little bit here there. I'll make some money. You can rent it out if you want. Doesn't this sound like a perfect place for him? What's the first thing he noticed? No telescreens. You walk in a room, you're like, there's no telescreens. Nah, too expensive, never really had the need for them. 
wait a minute, you have no tell screens? No, no tell screens. Uh, here's my deposit. You think he's going to love this place? For a man who's always paranoid about being watched, you can come and hang out in a place and do whatever you want with whomever you want, say whatever you want, have whatever meetings. And you don't have to worry about Big Brother. That's going to be a positive. Can you imagine how excited he was? As cool as that coral was, that doesn't even come close to this thing, to this room. And it's awesome. Um, bottom of 97, some of the other things, you know, there's a bed there. Um, the, there's a picture on the wall. The frame's fixed to the wall, but I could unscrew it for you, I dare say. So I could take it down if you want, but I, it's pretty much nailed to the wall, screwed to the wall. Oh, I know that building. It's a ruin now. It's in the middle of the street outside the Palace of Justice. Ah, that's right, outside the law courts. It was bombed, and oh, many years ago, it was a church at one time, St. Clement's Dane, its name was. And this little rhyme, this little limerick, nursery rhyme type thing, plays out. They can't quite remember all the words. Charrington helps them a little bit, but it's just one of those little nagging things like, man, what's that? How does that go? I remember the bells of St. Clement's, da, 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 da. It's just a little thing, so keep a mark on that. That's something of note. Just like we had that little bit of a, um, in the Chestnut Tree Cafe, under the spreading chestnut tree, I sold you and you sold me, and they start crying and all that stuff. Um, somewhat significant. Um, notice this church that is bombed out is now a museum. It used for propaganda displays of various kinds on page 99. So this church has been bombed out, and now since it's down in the party headquarters almost, downtown there, it's been turned into a museum for propaganda. So the church, bombed out, doesn't renovate as a church, but now it is a museum for Big Brother, for propaganda, and so on. Here, come look at all of our bombs and rockets and so on. Um, good, 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 good. Bottom of 100, after he takes it, he's, get, he's leaving. As he walks out, you think he's in a good mood? He found his coral. Okay, those of you who go shopping, ladies, and you find a really good deal, you're pretty much floating out that door, aren't you? You won't believe the sale I got on this. I'm, hey, if I get a great price on a DVD, I'm excited. Okay? So he's floating out of there. He has his coral. He has his new apartment that no one will ever find out about. And as he walks out, once again, snaps back into reality, he sees the dark-haired girl again. She has to be following me. There is no way... No probability that, oh, we just happen to be here again. She just shows up. And instantly, he wants to take that coral and bash her brains in and kill her. Again, those mental images. And he's petrified and scared. All